Today, we are back at Street Machinery Hot Rods and Classic Cars. They are located in Elucid, Ohio. Link in the description to look at this 1955 Chrysler New Yorker. But first, welcome to What It's Like. This channel, we feature the classics, vintage, some exotics, lots of orphan cars, and cars that are off the straight and narrow. Better way of saying off the beaten path. If that sounds like a channel that you'd be interested in watching, subscribe, turn on the bell icon next to it to never miss a video. Before talking about the 1955 Chrysler New Yorker, let's talk about all the brands Chrysler offered under the Chrysler umbrella. At the very bottom was Plymouth, followed by Dodge, followed by DeSoto, followed by Chrysler, and brand new for 1955, Chrysler offered the Imperial for the top of the heap. Very first year, 1955, of Virgil Exner's forward look, the cars were lower, longer, and wider than previous years, and they looked totally different. And the fins for the 1955 Chryslers were starting to show themselves. This is where the fin wars really started. It all started with Cadillac in 1949, but they really started... The fins really started to become their own once Virgil Exner was at the helm of design at Chrysler. Anyway, I wanted to point this out real quick before we move on. This is what I got whenever I typed in 1955 Chrysler lineup. This picture of this car, the car in the picture, I should say, isn't a 55 Chrysler. It is a 55 Chevy. They don't even belong to the same automotive family. But I just wanted to show this because the person that wrote this article thinks that the 55 Chevy is the same as a 55 New Yorker. Honestly, they aren't even on the same level of car. Chevy is in line with Plymouth, just saying. Google isn't any better either because they think turbo fire or turbo thrust means an actual turbo, and that's not what it means at all. Just throwing it in there. All right, getting back to 1955 with the Chrysler. Chrysler offered three trims in 1955. It's also worth mentioning that they dropped their six cylinder. Six cylinder engine was no longer available in 1955. The Windsor Deluxe was the base model. It came with a 301 cubic inch displacement V8. It was called the Semi Hemi because it used block, but it used poly heads, so it was advertised as the Semi Hemi. In the middle was the New Yorker Deluxe. We'll get back to it. At the top, 300 series for the very first time was offered in 1955, was at the top of the heap. It was the most powerful car in 1955, modified 331 cubic inch displacement Hemi with dual quads. It made 300 horsepower. But getting back to the New Yorker, body types on offer for the New Yorker were the four door six passenger sedan. These are all six passengers too, by the way. So two door Newport. They also offered a two door St. Regis, which was the top of the line two door. It offered a better interior and a higher price tag. They also offered a two-door convertible, a four-door town and country wagon, and there was also the option of getting just the bare chassis. Moving on to specs, 219 inches long, 79 and a half inches wide, 55.7 inches tall, 126 inches was the wheelbase. This thing weighs 4,158 pounds. Price, $3,650, which is equivalent to you spending $38,113 in the year 2022. Total 1955 Chrysler production was 152,777, of which 52,178 were New Yorkers. And of that number, the total Newport, because that's the car that we're featuring, is the Newport hardtop, was 5,777. Moving on to engine specs. The engine that was in the New Yorker was the 331 cubic inch displacement Hemi V8. It was 5.4 liters. It made 250 brake horsepower at 4,600 RPM, 320 foot-pounds of torque at 2,000 RPM. The bore was 3.8 inches with a stroke of 3.6 inches. Compression was 8.5 to 1, had five main bearings. Top speed was around 121 miles per hour. Transmission it used was the automatic power flight three speed. Moving on to some options, not going into all of the options on offer, but just a few. Air conditioning, backup lights, power electric window lifts, fog lights, power seat, power steering, power brakes, radio, rear seat speaker, spotlights, two-tone paint. Here's the door panel. 
this feels like a leather vinyl material and down here it feels more like a, a cloth material and then vinyl down here nice armrest that protrudes there door handle window crank and notice this window is all nicely trimmed out the vent window on to the button switches and knobs there are two pods directly in front of the driver on the left hand side is where the speedometer is located and notice it has a 120 mile per hour speed speedometer in the middle is where the tripometer is at the bottom is where the odometer is now if you turn your attention to the top right hand corner of this shot it's kind of it would be like in the center of the two pods that is where your turn signal indicators are. In the middle of the turn signal indicators, that little tiny red light comes on when your high beams are on at night. Moving your attention to the bottom left-hand corner, there is the parking brake is actually protruded outward. Above it is an idiot light telling you that the parking brake is pulled out. If you can't see the parking brake is pulled out and you need a little bit of a light, to make you aware that the parking brake is protruding out of the dashboard, it's almost like one of those Bill Engel, here's your sign, kind of things. Moving on, just below the speedometer are the climate controls. When they're pushed all the way up to the top where it says temperature, heat, defrost, that is the off position. And the higher you want to go, the further down the switch goes. In other words, all the way down would be the highest position. Moving on, there is one stock that comes off of this steering wheel column on the left-hand side. That is for your turn signals. Moving to the second pod. This pod has four gauges in it. The top two, fuel and oil. The bottom two are amp and temp. Just off to the right of that is the gear selector. Notice it's reverse, neutral, drive, low. There's no park, so one would have to engage the handbrake to park this vehicle without. It shouldn't roll whenever it's in a gear, but you would start it whenever it's in neutral, or you could put it in reverse to use reverse as park. Here's the ignition switch. It's found on the lower right side. Okay, moving to the center, there's five switches. Well, technically four, because one isn't a switch. The first one controls the lights. The second one is for the panel. Then in the center, that one is actually the lighter. Two switches on the other side of the lighter. One controls the wipers. The other one, the one on the end, controls the map dome light. Just below that is the radio with the radio controls. Just below that is the slide out ashtray. Coming back across, just above the opening of the glove box is a really nice clock. Word. Coming down to the pedal box here, they put an aftermarket stereo system in here and that's what that is for the speaker. This is your high beam switch. Notice the brake pedal, look at how big it is compared to my hand. Gas pedal. All right, it's time for the glove box test. Here's the glove box. It's not gonna fit in there, maybe. Holy cow, it fit. This is what the over the hood view looks like. Some sun visors up here, nice rear view mirror, sun visor there. This is what I look like. Lots of headroom in this car. My hair looks like a fro today. Lots of room underneath the steering wheel. This steering wheel is massive. And just the way that they position the steering wheel there's lots of room in here. And notice where my feet are, or my knees are. Nowhere near the dashboard. Right, getting into the back seat. Notice you don't have to push up on anything to move this out of the way. Just push it forward, and it pivots out of the way, giving you a nice rear access. I'm going to show what it's like actually getting in the back. And notice the way that these seat backs are formed. They're concaved. There's more of an overhang at the top here than there is back here. So you have plenty of leg room for the size of the car. It's a two door coupe, but my knees are in the back of this front seat, but it's very comfortable back here. Headroom, 
Got lots of headroom back here. It's very comfortable, like I said. Ashtray. Ashtray. And there's coat hooks for both sides as well as the light there's a light there and there's a light over here notice the windshield situation in the back look at how it wraps around it doesn't feel claustrophobic in this car at all here's the rear windows and here's how they operate that's what it looks like with both the windows down Just check out this trunk space. It's absolutely huge, full size spare. All right, moving to the under the hood section. After you pop the hood, there's a secondary catch that is right inside here and you just pull it, kind of pull towards you. Just check out this marvelous engine, Hemi generator it's got this weird doohickey on the back of it I would say that that would be a power steering yeah that looks like a power steering reservoir this has power brakes with a single master cylinder all right on to the pros and cons i'm getting all these pros and cons from the complete book of collectible cars blue chip auto investments 70 years from 1930 to 2000 by richard m langworth and the auto editors of consumer guide and what they have to say about it on the positive side attractive styling and still reasonably priced fast and luxurious against it slow to appreciate um, more slow than the 300s to appreciate a bit heavy on the chrome big heavy and thirsty but if you're reading this entry you don't really care thank you all so much for watching i really appreciate all the support and we finally got the channel to 6,000 subscribers and there'll be a video coming up real soon all right on to name that tune first person to get the song right with the band slash artist and title of the song will be pinned to the top of the comment section. Alright, until next time, toodaloo!